Please remain standing in honor today. We're going to observe a moment of silence for all of you who are governing the MIA. We miss your name. Your money. Um, please take this moment to defile your spirit. We as a panel, panelists, the committee, would like to take this opportunity to thank you for your service. Uh, it's very important that we acknowledge the service that you've given to our country. And we want to honor you today also for serving our country. Uh, thank you. Rounds, and I uh, also was at LZ Baldy and LZ Ross. I, I was in Vietnam from September 69 to April 1st, 1971. Just kidding, Dave. Uh, so, the way we're going to work this tonight is that in your program, if you'll notice on page three, there's a list of Vietnam War terms that you can look at and you can ask questions. You can ask any question you want as long as it's within reason. And we have two microphones, one on the left side in the aisle, one on the right side, and the ROTC cadets will bring it down and you raise your hand and uh, you can ask your question. And then I will direct your question to one of the panelists. Uh, and they will take time and answer. There might be two or three answers. Because you have 13 gentlemen here who are boots on the ground, a various experience. You won't find any information that they tell you tonight in textbooks. This is oral history. They're going to tell you exactly what happened while they served in Vietnam. And it's a good experience and a learning experience for the community and for our youth of today to see what our veterans have done and are doing today. So I'm going to start with uh, Mr. Jim Ponce. He can stand up and uh, tell us about a little bit of brief history about his service. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Jim Ponce, and I was drafted by the Army in September of 1960. I received orders to go to Vietnam in July of 1966 and was assigned to the Coast Air Cavalry Division. Our base camp was in An Kê, which, if you look on the map, uh, is right in the center of the country. Uh, I'm not sure I'm making it exactly right, but it's right in this area. And the, uh, the entire time I was in Vietnam, 
my service was basically from the Cambodian border out to the Gulf of Tonkin, just up to an area around the Nang. So pretty much this whole area right here is referred to as the Central Highlands. I was an ammunition supply specialist for about 10 months of my uh, one year tour of duty in landing zones and forward landing zones and occasionally the boondocks in Vietnam. My name is Alberto Ross. I served in Vietnam in the year 67 68. I was there for the Federal Offensive. I was in the combat in the years, but my job was payroll. I had to do the money drawing for the payroll. So that's what I did. I was completely my whole year. And uh, I, the first seven months, I was in west of Quinan, which is in the center. I cannot move my neck to tell you exactly from the map. But anyway, it's in the middle. Then the man, and I was west of Queen Anne in this area here. And then I went to the land, even though my people were north of the land, near the, near the beach. And uh, but we, had, we cannot have payroll any farther than the land. Uh, there was a few, uh, a few situations there, especially Marble Mountain. But other than that, I, I am here talking to you. So uh, it's, uh, that was my duty. My name is Michael Mazzaro. I served in Vietnam in 1968-69, the first cavalry division. I was uh, what most of you would call a lifer. I spent 22 years in the Army. Uh, I was stationed. Push the button. Push the signal. I was stationed out there at a place called Camp Evans, which is about 30 miles below the DMZ, for the first six months. And the second six months, I was down here in just north of uh, Saigon, a place called Phuc Vinh. I did travel this entire area here, end up in here as signal flying to many different locations, hills and valleys. Good evening. Uh, my name is Ed Bookman. I was drafted in December 1965. I was assigned to the 4th Infantry Division uh, in Fort Lewis, Washington. Uh, I spent my entire tour in Vietnam in the field. Uh, doing search and destroy missions. The first six months or so, it was up here in Tui Wa, mostly rice paddies in that area, and then moved us up to Taiku, Central Highlands, and our <coughs> area of operations were all that on the Cambodian border. Uh, that's it. Hello, my name is Big Bob. She <coughs> When I was in Vietnam, I was Little Bob. <laughs> <laughs> I was with the 25th Infantry Division. I was awarded, I didn't win, I was awarded the Silver Star for gallantry in action, the Purple Heart for wounded in action, the Air Medal for flying 25, 25 combat assaults in 30 days, and the CIB for combat infantry badge. And I was did my whole tour in a fire support basis at the end of the Ho Chi Minh Trail in what was called uh, the, Ho the Hobo Woods and the Renegade Woods, which is, I can't see the glasses on, the glasses off. <laughs> but right in here is where we were the whole time we were there. And I just shared with another uh, comrade of mine that was at Bowl City when we had a ground attack that um, a four-star admiral was there right after our ground attack, Admiral John McCain, Jr. With this little 300 men uh, base camp we were at. But he came out because his son was supposed to be uh, uh, handed over as a POW, which didn't happen for a couple of years after that. And I don't mind answering any questions. <laughs> if I can't answer, I'll give you one. My name is John Dervish. I was drafted. May 14, 1968, arrived in Vietnam, December 3rd, 1968. 
assigned to the Light Infantry Division down in the Mekong Delta of the 8th Battery, 3rd of the 34th Artillery, of the Fire Direction Control, where we plotted targets and calculated that information to send down to the guns so they knew which direction to fire. There's also a Charlie Company, 4th of the 47th Infantry, on a forward, forward observer team. I was the radio man. I called in the artillery strikes. I coordinated with the Air Force forward air controller on air strikes. The 9th Division was the first unit pulled out of Vietnam. I left Vietnam August 14th, 69. And both of those units I was with was part of the Noble River Raid Force. Our primary area of operations right down here in the meat town. And I spent 90% of my time on the rivers. Good evening. My name is Bob Rubel. I'm a retired Command Master Chief. I served 30 years in the world's greatest Navy. Yeah. 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 I served 15 months in Vietnam, assigned to the Naval Support Activity in Penang, and I was a skipper of an attack cargo va uh, vessel that ran the Perfume River to the Hue City and the Caveat River to the city of Dong Ha, which was uh, a very dangerous place to be two miles south of the DMZ. Tonight, you will hear several terms. You all know of the Battle of the Bulge. When you hear Tet, Tet Offensive was our battle of the bulge. That's when we got caught with our pants down and were almost overrun throughout the entire South. But we managed to come back and whip their family. Also, I took 17 men over. I brought 16 back to their loved ones, and I'm very, very proud of and thank you for having us here tonight. It's okay. Hello, my name is Mike Kaninsky. I enlisted in the Navy in 1967 to avoid the draft. In 1969, I was on a spy ship which got scrapped, and I put what they call a dream sheet. I then volunteered to go over to Vietnam, and I was what they call Brownwater Navy. We would actually go up the rivers. Now, I was on an LST reclassified as an assault patrol craft tender. And what we did, our primary job, was to take care and repair PBRs that were little river boats that actually went up the rivers. And also, we <coughs> serviced, and we didn't repair, but we serviced, refueled UE gunships. Um, the ship was turned over to the South Vietnamese Navy in October of 1970. <coughs> My main job on that ship was I was a second class engineer and also fuel oil, fuel oil and water cable. We mainly held out in the Mekong River and on last month we were over at a place called Sun on Dock and from there we went to Guam to turn the ship over. And thank you for having us in your school. My name is Cliff Shank, I was in the Navy. We were in Camp Tinshaw in Da Nang. Uh, and I'm surprised I didn't know him. I worked on the diesel engines with an engine man over there on boats, river boats. Plus, I was on the floating dry dock for a little bit, uh, which we sank in the water, repaired the bottom of the ship fitters that blowed the bottom of the boats out. The ship fitters welded them sheets back up and got the boats back out in the rivers. Uh, I was there during one December of 67, all of 68, and half of 69. I was there during the Tet Offensive, first week of January, and uh, uh, last week of January, and the first week of February. <coughs> it wasn't good. But the Marine Corps and the Army kept them BC off of us, even though we manned military weapons. Uh, that's it. Thanks. Uh, my name is Mike Lewis. I served with the 1st Battalion, 26 Marines. Uh, Tet Offensive, I don't know if you've heard about it, but Quezon was surrounded by two MBA divisions that tried to overrun us. We had a regiment of Marines there. Um, we averaged pretty close to 360 incoming rocket, motor, and artillery rounds per day. Uh, 
our motto was home is where you dig it because you were always digging trying to get deeper so that you wouldn't get killed it takes on for uh, some of you that don't know it set way up in the corner here five miles from the DMD and five miles from the Laogan border our job primarily was when we first got there to cut off the Ho Chi Minh Trail and through different uh, patrols and operations we discovered that they were really building up tremendously around that area and that was just before the Tet Offensive started. So a lot of my time was there firing back at the MBA that was firing down on us from the mountain ground and uh, consequently I ended up getting wounded up there case on but there were a lot of guys that did not walk out of there. So I thank you for all of you and being here and hearing us out and for the opportunity to share with you about what we did over there. Hello, uh, my name is Ken Ford. I enlisted in the Marine Corps in June of 66. The reason I enlisted, I knew I was getting drafted. My wife and I were getting married in July of 66 and the Marine Corps is getting a 90 day extension. Anyway, uh, I, uh, I, went, I went to get out. And we're still married after 50 years, so we a lot into it. Anyhow, uh, I went to Vietnam, arrived there in uh, November of 67, and uh, we were just south of Da Nang, and ultimately ended up uh, up at Phu Bai for the Tet Offensive. I was at 11th Marines Artillery, by the way. And uh, I ended up at An Wai, my last place, but we were in the field a lot, moving around. Uh, like I said, our main one was at uh, uh, Phu Bai for the Tet Offensive. Uh, and I came back and I got to go to San Diego and back to Camp Lejeune. Good evening. My name is Bill Daly. I received my draft notice in October 68. Decided the uh, Army Marine Corps was not for me, so I enlisted in the Air Force. Decided I liked it and spent a 26 year career in the United States Air Force, retiring with the rank E 8 Senior Master Sergeant. During my extended tour in Southeast Asia, I was stationed at Korat, Thailand. Some people call that a country club. It was anything but. And I was temporary duty at Tan Sanu Air Base on the military side of Saigon Airport. My assigned duties were Crew Chief F-4 Phantom aircraft and Crew Chief F-111 aircraft. For you Navy and Marine vets out there, my job title would have been plane captain. I was also assigned crash recovery duty members. That, that was not a very pleasant uh, part of my uh, career. Thank you. Good evening. I'm Dick Mallory. I enlisted in the Air Force right after uh, high school. Spent two years in the States. Got orders from Vietnam. Went over there for a year from 19, October 66 to October 67. I was a radio operator for a forward air control. Uh, we were stationed about 60 miles south of Lake on a MACB compound, it's a military affiliate. Military. Anyway, it's an advisory team. There's only 27 Americans there. Uh, we had uh, a, a battalion of South Vietnamese that was near us, and then three special forces came in our province. Our job was to go out and find the enemy, and we all found them. Um, I returned from Vietnam in October 67. And we were out in California, um, Travis Air Force Base, and decided to get out of the Air Force when I found out I had orders to go back to Vietnam. Thank you. Okay. Um, we take a few minutes. to the panel and ask appropriate questions. Uh, the ROTC uh, people in the back will you raise your hand, we'll bring the microphone to you and uh, you can ask your question and I will refer to one of the panelists. So uh, at this time, uh, anybody have any questions? Opinion, which movie accurately depicts 
what went on in Vietnam. Go ahead, Bob. Platoon. I say accurate too, the way, the way they talked, not so much all the stuff that they did, but the way they talked and acted uh, was pretty real. Okay, uh, anybody else want to answer that question? Yeah. Um, I'd have to say Full Metal Jacket. That it was very, very true, and a lot of this, there's a few discrepancies in it, but Full Metal Jacket was to me very true. Obviously it was Marine. Uh, 326 was one that, uh, 26 Marine was one of the ones that were involved up at uh, Wade, and like I say, to me, I can relate to that a lot. But also, as far as the tune goes, a lot of people may not know it, but Oliver Stone was in that unit. The story is basically his story. A lot of uh, stuff added, but Oliver Stone was in that outfit, in the outfit too. I would say for myself, it would be the beginning of Apocalypse Now, because it's the only movie that shows brown water plus a PBR. But only about the beginning of the movie, halfway through it. After that, it goes bonkers. Not a problem. Let me clear something up about the brown water. There were two navies over in Vietnam. The Blue Water Navy and the Brown Water Navy. The Brown Water Navy ran the rivers the Blue Water Navy was out in the Gulf of Tonkin, and they were very safe out there, in, uh, about 30, 40 miles off the coast. We all drank the brown water in the country too. Okay, anybody else have any questions for the panel? There's one back there in the middle there. Would you agree that the Blue Water Navy did do a lot of heavy gun support for ground troops? Absolutely. Absolutely. Sure did. Right. There Absolutely. was a lot of fire control, uh, heavy artillery, big guns. Absolutely. That supported boots on the ground. Plus the F-4 Phantoms that my friend Oh, the F-4s were Phantoms. Right. Yes, sir. F-4 Phantoms. Thank you. There's a question down here in the left. Second seat in fourth row. And this will go out to all of you, both drafted and volunteered. Would you guys do it again if you had the choice yes, to do it all again? Yes, indeed. We're open that stupid. We look at these young guys back here in the camouflage uniforms. That was us 50 years ago. We were lean, mean, <laughs> fighting machines. <laughs>
agents and companies really did us all, really did us in. Because we won the battles, but they wouldn't let us win the wars. Wouldn't you, do you feel that's true? Uh, personally, I don't think the media, the media had a lot to do with it. I mean, a lot of stuff they reported on television, you know, like much television. I, I don't remember where I came home and was home a couple of days and watching television one night, turned on the news, and there it was. Like, I, I just come home, and, and there's stuff, you know, and they always show the negative stuff. Uh, they could have done a better job of reporting, and I think they do that now to a point. Uh, but personally, in my opinion, I don't, I, I, the, the government is the one to scoot the pooch. They, they, you know. Ken? Yeah, uh, I'll throw a question back at you generally. Anybody ever hear of the Lai Massacre? Yeah. Okay, the Vietnam War basically was based on the massacre at Milai. The uh, media played it up, and that's all we did over there was shoot people indiscriminately just for the fun of it. And that's a, that basically what, what it went on for all the time we were there. Not even but slightly true, but that's what the media t that told people. Uh, body count, they always wanted body count. But yeah, like I can say, Milai, I always thought Milai was the basis for the Vietnam War, sadly. And it's not even a little bit true. They didn't show use that we were playing games with the kids over there. Yep, exactly. <clears throat> In fact, somebody met, did mention platoon. There's a scene in platoon where they go into the village, and if you watch it, the way it looks like they go in there just for the hell of it and eliminate the village. Okay, they do. I know they killed one guy, one papa sign, because he wouldn't respond. But if you pay real close attention, you'll see them carrying the kids out and whatever up, the other villagers, and they did destroy the village for one reason. There's an awful chance, there's an outside chance that the enemy was still there, had been there, or will come back. And by destroying the village, their food, they're destroying a base for them to come back to. Okay, uh, Jim Ponce wants to answer the question, then John Dovish. I think there was so much politics in the war, um, unfortunately. I, I can remember one incident that occurred at a, 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 a landing zone we were at up in the Highlands, and one night we were mortared, and quite a few mortars came in and um, ended up with three men being killed and 30 men being injured. And I remember them, we were trying to figure out why we weren't shooting back. Our artillery and mortars were not firing back. And it was because orders came down from higher up that we were not to return fire because the rounds coming in were coming from a close, friendly village. That was the kind of stuff that the games that were played over there by our government. and. Um, it, it still makes me mad today to, to know that all those men were, were killed and injured and we were not allowed to defend ourselves. Mm -hmm. Good story. John? Uh, like Jim said, the politicians had a lot to do with it. And uh, one example of the political aspect of it, I was firing artillery one day, blowing up a uh, bunker complex. I got called back, I got shut off from the artillery. They said, unless I have a confirmed target, I can't shoot any more artillery. The only way I could get more artillery that day was if we were in contact. Mike Goose, that A lot of people don't um, know that toward the end of the Vietnam War, the North Vietnamese, North Vietnamese were close to surrendering to the United States. And the general for the North Vietnamese Army said this years later, and you'll find it that they stopped the bombing of North Vietnam, and they were so close to surrendering, his statement was, 10 more days and we would have had to surrender. So we were 10 days from actually having the North Vietnamese surrender in that war. But because of some decisions that were made in the United States, and um, there was McNamara and a couple others who were afraid that the Russians were going to get involved, so they stopped the bombing in North Vietnam. And when that happened, that gave new life to the North Vietnamese. 
So people say you lost a war. We didn't lose it. The politicians lost it for us. We, did, we didn't lose that war. It was those that were above us that didn't continue to fight the thing the way they should have fought it. Hey, uh, we get our orders in the morning. We wake up, pack your stuff up. Sergeant will get down to the command post, get the orders for the day. We're going to show us a map. We're going from here to here. Okay, no big deal. You can, if you see, see the enemy or see anything that doesn't look right, do not fire. We spotted a, a patrol one late one evening walking across the rice paddy. We knew they were carrying weapons and food, couldn't fire at Now, if they would have fired us, we could return fire. So it was, they called it a fire zone, basically. They, they, I guess they still have them today. It's a lot of it. And then there were other areas where we went in, and it was a free fire zone. Anything that moved, you shot. You shot. Uh, I don't understand the rationale behind that, but my only kill in Vietnam was a water buffalo. <laughs> Just, just, just to uh, reiterate what you're saying there, I was with Mike 37, and I know many times uh, if we saw an enemy running across the rice paddies, the first question they asked us from the rear was, are they wearing black pajamas? Do they have weapons? Can you see it? Before you were allowed to shoot. So you just couldn't shoot out there. Now, the free fire zone was a different story. Anything that walked or moved in there, you could shoot. And uh, that did happen a lot of times. So uh, very different uh, ideas of how the war was fought. Fought. And I know we as, as, as troops, we kept asking questions, why don't they give us the authority to do the things we need to do to win? And it didn't happen that way. Any other questions? Down here's one. And then we'll, you, you asked before, right? The guy in the black hat right there. He's the right there. Hi, this is probably for all of you, but basically uh, maybe Mike Lewis and Bob Chavis, um since you were in close order combat, we know for sure one was wounded, one had a silver star. Um, what method or how did you overcome your fear in battle? Well, yeah, I'm still, I'm still dealing with it. Um, I see a uh, therapist every six weeks to two months, and uh, you know, I learn how to live with it. And um, I just de I deal with it. This you don't forget something like that. This is part of the therapy. This helps a lot of guys. A lot of guys, it doesn't. But some of us, it helps. Yeah. This does help me. Mike Lewis, talking about it does help me. I, I, feel, I feel very fortunate from the standpoint that uh, PTSD probably has not affected me as much as it has others, mm -hmm. even though certain sounds certain smells will all of a sudden trigger something in your mind and all of a sudden Absolutely. a rush comes back and um, it's hard to forget when you've seen somebody that was killed just a few feet from you. It's not anything that leaves your mind ever. I, walk, I was walking down the trench line up there at Quezon and we started getting incoming. I walked right past a guy who was shaving. Okay? I went probably 30 yards down, and when I came back, here this guy and water around landed in his shaving gear and took his head off. And I said good morning to him not more than 10 minutes before that. So you don't forget that stuff. <laughs> you, you, you try to put it in the back of your mind and not let it affect you. But I, I really thank the good Lord that he's helped me. I know there's a lot of guys that it's been really tough on. Let me, let me uh, give a little experience of what I have. Uh, I now am rated 70% post-traumatic stress syndrome with the VA. When I got out of the military, I went to Millersville University. I was a graduate of Millersville here. Uh, back in 1973, I had some problems, and I ended up in the VA hospital in Lebanon. I was in a locked ward for 56 days. Back then, they put you on the, the drug of choice was Thorazine. And um, what happened was after 56 days, they left me out, but they gave me a diagnosis of passive aggressive personality with explosive tendencies. Now they call it post-traumatic stress syndrome. So, you know, when you think about those, 
those experiences, like, like Mike and like Bob said, and I told Jim this not too long ago, the first person I saw get killed in Vietnam while I was in country three weeks, I cried like a baby. He died right in front of me. I was the last person he saw alive. His name was uh, Lloyd Newman. He's from Florida. I finally found out where he lived. I finally found his information. For all these years, his situation, his dying in front of me has haunted me. Because all I do is see, look and I see, I have, I have uh, nightmares of him just looking me in the eyes. He's sucking for air and dying. And there's no way that any training can prepare you for those things. What happens is you get hardened, you learn to realize it's a war, you can't sit there and you can't cry, it's not going to change it. You got to get tough, you got to be strong, and you got to make sure you stay alive. But it does create problems for different people. I handle death differently than many other people. But it's hard to know that uh, the military cannot train you to accept that. You have to go through it. It's an experience that you can, it's hard to even explain. Bob? I have a friend today who lives in Etown. He's part of the Navy Club here in Lancaster. He was in a tank in the Army with three other guys. The three guys in the tank with him were shredded before his eyes. Now it's been 47 years, 48 years, and this guy is still suffering. He still is on the suicide watch list up in Lebanon. And when I talk to him, you know, it's something that you'll never forget. And the harder you try to forget, the harder it is. The harder it is. So you have to accept the fact that you're still here for a reason. And as far as overcoming fear, you will overcome fear. I had a beautiful wife and two beautiful babies to come home to. So I overcame my fear. It gave me gray hair, <laughs> but I'm home. <laughs> Ed, uh, alluding to what Mike said about seeing a uh, guy get killed, that happened to me, a uh, guy in my platoon, Stanley. Saw him that morning, said hi, nice, nice kid from uh, Louisiana. Uh, later that day, he was killed by a machine gun. I was there when it happened and heard the shots. And I heard one of the guys hollered, Stan, are you okay? The first time he yelled, he said, yes. And he said, can you see him? And he said, no. And the next thing you know, there was another round of machine gun fire, and that was it. Stan was killed right there. And then we had to stay there and secure the LZ, and I had to sit there and witness. They loaded 22 bodies of guys from my company. No, I'm sorry, they were in, they were in the Charlie company. They were in a big battle that morning. We went to secure it. And I sat there. We had to secure the LZ so they could come in. The, the, the wounded were already taken out of there. They were gone by the time we got there. And all that was left was the, was the bodies of the dead. And to see them load that helicopter with those guys, it's something I'll never forget. And, it's, and I didn't know any of them. Stan was the only one I knew. He was smart company. Okay. But just like, just like Jeff said, it's something you'll never forget. Never. Alberto? In my, uh, my company, I was sitting between two hutches or tents to be waiting to be processed. And at the time, that this was the first day, there was mortars that began to fall in. And they told me where to go. The guy told me to get into the bunker. I, was just, I didn't know where to go, to be honest. Anyway, uh, I found out that the guy who was a finance clerk uh, only had two weeks in, to go before he returned to the U.S. He wanted to take a picture of the mortars falling in, at least the smoke, because you can be very hard to think you're going to trigger the camera when you In those days, we didn't have a telephone that take pictures. We have real cameras. But anyway, he, uh, he, he thought that he was going to take a picture of one of the mortars falling in the, in the, in the fire. And in reality, the mortar ground fell right behind him. And it, it got him here on this part of the neck. And, uh, he was dead. That was my first time that I saw something that resembled a war the way I picture it. So uh, I pick up, uh, I, was, I was yelled at by the company commander that went by and he said to pick him up and take him to the medics. Of course I didn't know where the medics were, they just arrived. 
So anyway, he used very, very uh, nice tone of voice and uh, very lovely words. And he told me another guy came over with the gurney and would pick him up and, and took him to the medics. So the next morning he came over and he said, uh, you got his job. Of course, I didn't know what his job was going to be. And uh, even so I was trained for personnel, he said, you are now the finance. <coughs> so that's how I, my career in the last two years, the first in Vietnam and then in, in the States, and I was a finance clerk. Uh, the second experience was during TED. I was uh, in a cobra with another guy. And I told him that I am I'm going to have to uh, curl back a little bit to make sure that I do not make the smell come by near where I was. So uh, when I went back, I saw a body of a person that was laying flat against sandbags. And uh, so I said, oh God, what is that? So I walked, I crawled over there because you were not supposed to stand up. And uh, it, 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 there was a Vietnamese man. He was not in pajamas. He had a sort of half a civilian uh, American outfit on him. And but he had a hole right in the middle of his forehead. And he was the reason he was killed is because our uh, our uh, cook, uh, the sergeant who was in charge of the kitchen, got on a rafter of a little com compound uh, rafter that we have to store our food. And this guy was crawling in under the wire to steal food for his family. But in the, uh, during the Tet Offensive, if you, after 7 o'clock, you were dead. You were caught anywhere. So that was my first, uh, my second uh, picture of this. And then, of course, I have all that incident, but these were the ones that remain in my mind, the most vivid ones. And uh, the, the man was stealing food for his family, but unfortunately, it was not supposed to be in our compound, especially during the Tet Offensive. Bill Daly? Uh, yeah, I, I agree wholeheartedly with my brothers here on this panel in regards to PTSD being a ticking time bomb. All these years later, we, to different degrees, uh, suffer from images, flashbacks, whatever you may want to call them. My wife is here in the audience. I have woken her more than once, sitting up, screaming, in the middle of the night. My F4 family, my name was on the side of this. That was an extension of me. I watched her go down, taking both air crew with her. We were still bombing Cambodia in 1973. They took some ground fire, some lucky hits. Basically, the aircraft laid out the hydraulics and the pneumatics, <laughs> all those dead sticking and coming back. They could have punched out, they could have saved their lives. But dedication that the military has for each other in, in all the branches drove those to, to bring it back at all costs, and it cost them <coughs> their lives. As a crash recovery crew member, I had the unpleasant duties of going out and picking up what was left. I was the one that came upon the largest piece of identifiable human flesh. It was a boot with a leg bone still sticking out of it. I still okay. see that. Okay, go ahead. Never take your freedom for granted. I work with an Army Vietnamese captain. When they war was supposedly over, he left to come over here to the United States. He had his baby in his arms. BC killed the baby. And he comes over here with not that baby no more. I asked him, I said, would you go back to Vietnam? He said, I can't. He said, if I go back to Vietnam, they would kill me. So even now the war is over, they would still kill him because of what he did. Okay, uh, we have a question. Go ahead. Yeah. Get the microphone. I thank you for your answers. I didn't mean for you to get into a lot of gory details, but what I was talking about was, uh, you know, when you get under fire, you, know, you can either cower in a foxhole or you can overcome that fear somehow and start acting and doing the right thing. And I wondered what was the trigger? What, what happened there? Training. I mean, in my, my case, in my company, it was training. 
We didn't have time to think. You didn't think about what you, how you should act. You just acted because you were trained a certain way. So you overcame your fear that way. If you started to think, that's when you got killed. That's when you got in trouble. Because the way he trained you to do certain things in certain situations. And by thinking, we, and I'm a teacher, we tell people you got to think. Well, in combat, thinking doesn't get it. Thinking gets you killed. You got to act the way you were trained. And uh, he's right. Uh, you don't have to, people a lot of, we do high school similar to this. And a lot of kids ask you, you know, were you scared? You don't have time to be scared. You're scared after the fact. And it was a lot of years after the fact, oh, why did I do that? <laughs> we stopped for lunch one day. Everybody took their backpacks off, set up a perimeter, sitting around, having a good time, eating our lunch. Shirts off, catching the rays, having a good time. Next thing you know, gunfire from the other side of the perimeter. So everybody grabs their helmets and trying to find a place to hide. We were obviously out in the open, no place to hide. We didn't, we didn't even dig a hole because we were only going to be there 15, 20 minutes. And the rounds were flying over around, and the guys were yelling and hollering. But everything was in the back of us. They say, keep looking out that way, because we didn't know how many there were, if it was a squad, if it was a company, if it was a battalion, we didn't know. Uh, and we were all looking out this way, and two guys down from me was a guard in our squad with a machine gun. And he was close to that uh, and a, a machine gunner has him, and then he has a, a guy with him that carries a lot of the rounds. For some reason or another, he was over there. How he got separated from the machine gun, I don't know. So somebody hollered for the machine gun, set the machine gun up. And he said, he said, where's the ammo? So I looked down, and there it was, down over there. So I just crawled down and grabbed one of those big, long bandoliers like John Wayne carries or Rambo, and drug it up to where the machine gun was. And as I'm doing this, the, gra the, the ground was little pings, and it was, they were, it was rounds that were shot. They, they, covered, they, they overshot the main part of the company that they were firing at. And then I just took the rounds and then went back to my position. It was over in 15 minutes. When they when they went in, when they went in to clear, it, they didn't find anything. But it must have been it must have been a big one because they were really fired and they were hollering and yelling. So they were in the head. They had been. I don't think they were being calm. They don't yell like that. Mike Lewis, overcoming fear, Ed. There was one thing, one fear that I never overcame when I was over there. And we were getting um, heavy incoming. We went into the bunker and we told everybody to get out of the bunker, get into the trench because it was a safer place to be. Your eyes were a lot higher if you were in the trench rather than in a bunker. One of the guys in, it was in my squad uh, that was asleep in there, when I shook him and told him to get out, he didn't get out right away. Artillery round went into that bunker. And I went back in afterwards and um, feeling around in there and trying to find him. And I put my hand in his neck. And I never overcame that fear. I never went into another bunker to see who was in there after that. I was a squad leader, and yeah, I sent other guys in, but the truth is, I was afraid I was going to run into another guy with no head. So, that was one thing that I was not able to overcome. There's, it, it just happened to be that um, this guy, over there, he, was, he was new over there. He wasn't there very long. He was one of the newbies. But he didn't get out of that rack and get out in the trench like he was instructed. So you try to say to yourself, well, he didn't do what I told him to do. That's not, that, that still doesn't justify the fact that you have a fear of that happening again and again. So uh, there are things that you fear. If you don't fear something, then you're a fool, okay? You can say, if you can sit up here and tell me that you didn't fear something, then you're the fool, because I tell you what, there are things you should fear. So. Okay, we're going to move on now. We can talk about this for days, probably. Yeah. So I'll ask you one to another question. Uh, I was thinking now, maybe, uh, like uh, blue water. Anyway, a crash course in history. A long time ago, someone tried to make us a part of the British Empire. We didn't like that. Then we had a civil war, 
And that went and came, and nobody stuck their nose into it, and we survived that. Then World War II came along, and we had a lot of the world with us. Then North and South Korea came along, and that was someone else's civil war, essentially. Then North and South Vietnam came along, that was someone else's civil war. Now, at the London VA, I'm still pushing back on the dating back to World War II in wheelchairs. Have we learned anything? I mean, Vietnam was 50 years ago. Have we learned anything? What's your points? It's cost them a lot of money. Your health care, my health care, the uh, everybody at our 150 plus veterans hospitals, this has cost them a fortune. Have we learned anything? Are we going to ever win? Or are the politicians just going to lose? Go ahead, Mike. Go ahead, Mike. I would say. Let Mike answer that. I would say, overall, regardless of your age, regardless of the young people sitting there, the cost of freedom is high. If you want to be overrun, then just open up the pearly gates. That's the only thing I can say. Absolutely. Anybody else want to, answer, want to give a stab to that? Jim. Next question over here, Tom. Well, you're not, oh, get that guy back here. He's, he's standing there. Get the <laughs> As a Vietnam veteran myself and 29 months in Vietnam, first of all, I'd like to thank the panel for what you're doing here tonight. Second, I'd like to ask you a question. Uh, coming home from Vietnam, which we all did in the uh, 60s, you wonder the way we were accepted. Do you find today the same disagreement in the United States, the way things are today, compared to some of the servicemen coming home. Like you have actors, you have people talking about we should get out, we should go here and there. Do you find when Hanoi Jane was over in Hanoi, do you find actors today doing the same identical thing? Go ahead, Ed. I've often said this a lot of the schools. The only good thing that came out of the Vietnam War was the way that the guys are treated today. These committees, these guys that go to the airports and welcome these guys home. And we get to get to get it's kind of amazing, but it's true. I mean, you go out and someone knows you're in a circle. Thank you for your service. You're quite welcome. You know, and that's, that's all you have to say. But that, that's just the way, you know. And, Coming home was rough. It wasn't for me. I didn't have it too bad coming home. I came home early. I, well, not early, but I was over in 66, 67. But the guys that came home in the 70s, because they're the ones that caught all the crap. Bill, Bill Being Bill spit Bill. on at the airport and things like that. Uh, the protests and things. But I, I didn't physically, myself, witness any of that. But that's the only thing good coming these guys today. Uh, and I, have, I have the most respect for any black person in the for. No matter what branch. Bill. Except for <laughs> That's a national organization, Vietnam Vets of America, has a motto. And that motto is, never again will one generation of veterans abandon another. Now, they say World War II veterans, they were the greatest generation. Yes, their war was on a larger scale than ours, but they turned their backs on us. Our fathers, as a generation, and the nation turned their backs on us. Now you can forgive. I'm a Christian man. I can forgive, but I can't forget. When I came home, my baggage was misplaced. I had to run the gauntlet at Philadelphia International Airport in uniform. Two things happened to me as an adult. I came up the steps from the tarmac, because they wouldn't even open up one of them gates for us. We had to walk in second-class citizens. Somebody spat down on me. It landed on the toe of my highly polished service dress shoe. When I got to the top of the steps, the second thing happened to me for the first time as an adult. My father, a World War II ball turret gunner in the B-17, hugged and kissed me. He was not a very emotional man. You would say he suffered from PTSD, but it wasn't called that back then. So yes, the veterans today, they, they do have a better homecoming, and so they should. And we respect each and every one of them. Thank you. 
Okay, next question. Over here, please. Over here, go ahead. When I went in in 1980, one of the things that I was taught when I was learning to fire the laws um, was to destroy the weapon completely. Did you on the panel have any problems with that, uh, with VC using, reusing stuff that wasn't supposed to supposedly ever be reused again and or using it for um, uh, traps, you know, that you would you would find in the, the woods, supposedly. Bob, uh, Rubel, I had a uh, number of laws on my craft running the rivers. We did farm, and when we farm, we'd taken crackle over the railing of the railing on the on the craft to make sure that they were cracked and could not be used again. Now the VC were very ingenious, very good with their hands. They could, they could put a bomb in a pack of cigarettes and float it down the river to blow up one of the craft that was going up the river. Very ingenious, so that's why he tried to destroy everything that you had used. Yeah, I was going to say that the, um, you know, I was out in the field, so whenever we used the law, any, anything that we used, we carried back to our base camp and we burned it. And uh, because, once again, they, the uh, Vietnamese could make all kinds of stuff and they did all kinds of booby traps. So uh, we were very conscious of that. And like I said, we carried it back and we burned a lot of it. In fact, all of it we could. And we never left nothing out there in the bush. Now I take uh, the radio, I changed the radio battery every morning. And I, that old battery that I took out, I'd break it up into pieces and throw it in the water, whether it be a ditch or a canal or whatever. Because they, they could take that used battery and uh, use it to set off a booby trap. Alberto? Yeah, well, I worked in, uh, in the NAG at the, at the finance. We still had to go and pull guard. And the guard was near Marble Mountain. And my, I, I had myself, I was the, uh, the leader, and I had four other men. And uh, we found out that the morning after there was a battle of Marble Mountain, there was uh, seven people were killed there. Seven of us were killed there. And I do remember that uh, I said to, uh, to this uh, 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 sergeant who was coming down from wherever they were, they were in a patrol, and he said, did you guys so watch the wire? And I said, what wire? There's nothing wrong with the wire. The Viet Cong had uh, made tunnels on the midst of wire to go into our, into, to these people where we have all kinds of junk, because they had, they had a broken uh, trucks, they had uh, cannon tubes, they had everything. And they used the metal to fabricate uh, bombs and uh, cross up bodily harm on them, or whatever they used. It. So they were coming, and they said, Do you realize that you were right next to those tunnels? And I went and saw the tunnel, I was perfectly honest. I was glad it was daylight, because at night time of a tunnel like that would have really uh, put the uh, scares of anybody else. So uh, that's the way they did. They, they dug the tunnels to steal the metal to fabricate explosive, explosive bombs. We blew the tunnels after that. After that. Mike? A lot of the uh, booby traps that they used to use, and they do today, is the same thing. They use unexploded bombs, artillery shells, mortar. They just reuse them. They're brave because the fuses are ready to go on a lot of it. Even even sea ration cans. They always told us to smash the cans. Sea ration cans are always crushed. Yeah. Crushing the beer. Yeah. They would put a grenade inside, pull a pin on a grenade, stick it inside a can, and then run a wire across the trail. That happened to us one day. And luckily, the guy on the front stepped over. He didn't see it, but the guy behind him did. And that's what it was. It was a sea ration can, which probably isn't any bigger than this cup. And the end was all from it. They had some leaves on top of it and stuck a hand grenade in there and then attached a wire to it. 
So if they would have tripped up the first couple of guards, they would have got them. But that's what they told us. Don't leave anything around. They use everything. Okay, another question, please. Who's, who's next? <coughs> this lady down here. Um, I understand this might be a strange question as far as the um, status of marijuana use in Pennsylvania, but I was just wondering if you had any thoughts on the use of marijuana as far as coping with PTSD. I never touch the stuff. I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> 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 I like to ask you about that. about marijuana. When I got to Vietnam and we went on our operations, we had little kids, probably three, four or five years old, would come up to us and would sell us two live specials, try to sell us two live specials. Ten joints uh, that, that long for a dollar is what they would try to sell. Little kids, I mean, little kids would do this. I mean, that was a shock to even know what happened. So the drugs were there, but it doesn't necessarily mean the troops used them. But it was available and it was good stuff. So. <laughs> Children would come to the truck and they would have a plastic bag and they said, A hundred reefers, ten dollars. Mama Sound said, Ten dollar reefer. And they, my one was, you can, you can buy it anywhere. <coughs> but to be perfectly honest, uh, I only have one incident with one fellow in my, in my group who decided he was going to smoke marijuana in my tent. Uh, that was the only time I used a little bit of physical violence to display his stuff out and threw him out and told him to go somewhere else. Because marijuana smells like very sweet, and it's a blue smoke, it's just so you identify it. And it breaks very bad. Your mind doesn't act the same way. So, that was my experience with the Ted and Bob. Well, <clears throat> I was out in the bush. And, and by the way, everybody's got a different story up here. Um, because it depends on where you were at and, uh, you know, location. I was in, out in the bush right at the end of the Ho Chi Minh Trail. And there was 300 of us. And we didn't do no drugs, because our lives depended on it. And were the drugs there? Yes. You know, you could buy a, a, a pack of, uh, I think it was Cools, and they actually took the um, uh, cigarette tobacco out and they put the marijuana in it. They also sold you a little tube of opium for like $2. But we, we didn't use that stuff. You know, our, our lives depended on it. So even in the movie Platoon, they showed them, you know, smoking all that marijuana and all that. We didn't do that. You know, sometimes when you went back in the rear, some of the guys did, but uh, I would say 80% of us never never touched any marijuana when we were over there. Now, maybe when we got back, I didn't, but some of the guys uh, did. I, I talked to them often. We had a reunion. And some of the guys got messed up on drugs after we got back. And I can kind of understand it, you know, uh, you know, dealing with post-traumatic stress and, uh, you know, just things were tough over there when we were there. Ed Bookman? Uh, yeah, just like what Bob had said, uh, we, we get that asked a lot of the high schools they have a lot of, with, about the drug problem. Yes, there was a drug problem, and it depends on where you were, the time you were there, et cetera. Like Bob said, the guys back in the base camps and, and the big air bases, and et cetera, they had, some of them had jobs. They worked like from nine to five, eight, whatever. But when you're out in the field, you know, 24 seven, you can't be messed up. Uh, it happened, I mean, I mean, there were a few times when I was witnessed it, but uh, we were on, on downtime, but still, you, you, you gotta keep your head about it because like you moved too early, you know, something happens and you don't know what to do right away, you're going. Okay, next question. Uh, anybody else? There's a soldier back there in the back who's trying to ask a question. Hi, Dad. Give him the microphone. Hey, I wanted to ask if anybody had been back to Vietnam recently and visited. Not me. No way. No, but, the, but, but I know I've talked to people who have gone back and said we'd be surprised to see how built up it was. 
uh, the area I spend time in, they say there's all kind of ha uh, hotels there, condos, lots of property in Quezon Province, uh, which is 26 miles south of the name. So I guess it's changed a lot, although I think if you have PTSD uh, and other problems, I think going back could be healthy and could help you try to get rid of those problems that you do have. But uh, no, I don't think I've never went back. I'd like to, but I haven't done it yet. Uh, my wife and I just spent a year in, in Vietnam, and I would recommend anybody that feels they can go back, should go back and visit. I've, I've talked a lot of vets on nostalgia tours around the platoons and different things. And just, just going back to the armaments, um, I was talking, I was all over Vietnam last year, and I talked to a number of uh, NGOs uh, from Ireland and different places that are digging up bombs. Four years later, uh, up and around uh, the La border, up by the Perkin River, up by Quezon, Ho Chi Minh Trail, Hawaii uh, City. And they're coming to the realization now that one third of all the armaments dropped, and it was millions of tons of armaments up around the 17th parallel, did not go off. They're still in the ground, they're still digging them up today. And uh, one of our Fulbrighters that was with us that was out doing world uh, wildlife work out in the woods on the law border, told me a story about cutting his way through the jungle, and he was about 6'5", a boy from Texas, and fell down, and uh, it was all cut up. He gets up, and his, his uh, legs were all cut up, and he looked back, and he was a cluster bomb sticking out of the ground. This is 40, 50 years later. The stuff is still there. There's, there's all kinds of armaments around, but they're still digging up. Every time they uh, lay a water line, put in a new house. You mentioned Da Nang. Da Nang is completely rebuilt. Uh, there's a new bridge there. They've taken the uh, air base down and they're making new housing. And uh, it's just incredible. They've got five star hotels in China Beach right now. Uh, tourism. Uh, you can go up the uh, Royal Mountain as a tourist. And I would suggest anybody uh, that's interested to go back to Kuchi as a tourist. It's just incredible. Uh, the displays here goes towards all around the tunnels. It's really something. It really showed you that it was a total guerrilla war, and I don't think we had any idea what was going on there uh, in, in some of those areas. So I recommend anybody that's interested to go back and visit. You'll be welcome. Other questions out here? I don't have that, sir. Go ahead. I was going to say, um, all of your number one GIs, but you haven't told the people you're all dinky now. Um, well, that's the other side of it. Um, now, the, the point I want to bring out is a correlation. Have any of you had the experience since being home one of our brothers committing suicide. I had Ken. four guys that were in my squad. Now the 20, there was 24 of us. Four of them have already committed suicide. I have so I'm originally from Buffalo, New York, by the way. We don't get in the weather. Anyhow. Uh, my best buddy in, uh, in Vietnam, I'm not going to mention his name or anything, but at the time I didn't realize he lived here in Lancaster County in Willow Street. I come back, obviously didn't know because I said we moved to Lancaster, and I read his obituary. His picture's there, and it's the same as it was when we were in Vietnam. Two years later, I found out he committed suicide. That'll never, ever, ever leave my mind that my good buddy lived down the street, basically, from me. I lived in Ann Arbor Township. He lived in Willow Street. My good buddy lived down the street, technically. Never got to know about it. I read about him in the paper. And that, it always bothered me. You know, always bothered talking me. about PTSD. Um, there is a new treatment for PTSD. The VA is evaluating. DOD is looking for volunteers. It has an over 60% cure rate. And uh, if anybody's interested, I'll clearly send them the, the video. 
and show you what goes on. Thank you. Can I just uh, I'll answer that? I just went through a course on PTSD at the VA. I had to go to 12 sessions uh, every two weeks from 5.30 to 7.30 with other veterans, and they actually had to give us a book. It looks like a textbook. And we went down through the whole PTSD problem from day one till the end. So they, you know, they at least in London, they're doing that right now. And I was in that program. They're still giving them drugs and not getting any treatment. Didn't give me any drugs for it. Question over this side. Here's one here in the middle of this guy here. Stand up, thank you. Thanks everyone for being here. I appreciate it very much. Uh, I was in Vietnam for 359 days, 17 and a half hours. <laughs> R67, R67. Uh, I had a special kind of watch. Anyway, uh, and I arrived in Fubai on January 28, 1968, so you'll know what, uh, well, I didn't know what I was expecting. But there are two things that relate back to uh, what you're talking about, being restricted from firing on suspected uh, Viet Cong. Those are the rules of engagement, and unfortunately, and related to a question asked earlier about whether we've learned anything, uh, from a visit I made to Walter Reed, uh, two or three years ago, talking to wounded vets, a uh, couple from Afghanistan, they were complaining about rules of engagements there that restricted them from firing when they knew they were at threat and at risk because not until they were fired upon could they return fire. So I'm not sure if I have a question or a statement, but I wonder to myself, when are we going to stop restricting our soldiers by these lawyer-developed rules of engagement? Before you answer, I have one other point. You're I'm reading the Vietnam. The I'm sorry? You're preaching to the choir. Yeah, I know. Yeah. Uh, I, have, I want to just say something about the terms, Vietnam War terms. There's a term not on here that meant a great deal to me, something that I became intimately familiar with very much. And I want to get your reaction to this. Bam Mi Ba. Bam Mi Ba. 33, 33. Yeah, that's not on here. <laughs> well, I listed you, that could be pages and pages. <laughs> yeah. well, we did take some names off, though. We did take some off. Yeah, that was it. That's one I knew very well. For those of you who don't know what We didn't think that they were right for to this audience. Not for us. this side over here. Yeah, no, the rules of the game. Yeah. Right here, this guy, right here. Yeah. <laughs> yes, uh, great to be here just after the Korean War. Uh, looking at all these amazing buttons, and of course a lot of them are anti-Vietnam War buttons. I love the anti-Jane Fonda buttons, by the way. Uh, my, my question is, when you were over there fighting and dying, were you aware of all the protesting that was going on against the war here in America? And if you were aware of it, did it affect morale at all? Yeah, you wasn't aware of it, because uh, Stars and Stripes, it was more or less censored. They only wanted you to print what they wanted you to hear. And our source of radio was censored. You, you knew there was some going on, but you really didn't know the extent of it. Well, everything that we received through our forces radio was filtered. Now, we did get a Stars and Stripes newspaper. And now also, was filtered. We didn't know about the real protests going on, how the country was divided, until we made that return flight and we landed, most of us, in San Francisco, where all that BS started. We still haven't forgotten it. No. And never will. If, seen, if anybody has seen the movie The War in Vietnam with Robin Williams, that's true. When it would head in that sheet of the news and all the stuff was blacked out, and they, they blacked stuff out. And like you said, the Stars and Stripes, the little newspapers we would get occasionally. It was the same way. I never knew anything about the protest. That really? I, that's, that's interesting because in my unit, uh, whenever there was a protest back in the United States, we'd get hit. In other words, they, the enemy would hit us. And somebody would get injured, and somebody would get killed. I mean, I was there uh, 
August, September 69 to uh, April 71. And uh, we got hit a lot of times. And we, we found out about the protests, and they, they knew it too. And when there was a protest, that's when they like hit us. So we got that. I mean, it was, a, it was a bad feeling about protesters. I mean, it put a bad taste in your mouth thinking that, not that they didn't have a right to protest, but they, I don't think they realized what they were doing to the troops in Vietnam. It was harming us, the individual soldier on the ground. Yeah, but the guys a little later, like you said, you said about the homecoming, that, that, that happened to a lot of guys that come home, like you said, 69, 70, et cetera. But I came home in 67, it didn't, wasn't worth any of that. And like you said, the little newspaper we got once in a, we got mail maybe once a week, and every now and then you get a paper which had to hand it around. And not everybody got a stars and stripes. But it was all it was all happy news, you know, the weather back home, the baseball scores, the yada yada yada. And it was a picture the picture in there one time of a girl in Asia. And I said, Excuse me? You know, I, and I, I, I couldn't I said, yeah, the girls are wearing this. And then when I got home and landed in, in Oakland, and after I was on the way to the after I was through processing on the way to the airport in the terminal, there was a girl in the industry, I just can't believe it. <laughs> I've been scarred for life. <laughs> <laughs> One of, one of the many hats I wore over there was mail clerk. <laughs> Everybody loved me. <laughs> uh, a lot of the guys get hometown newspapers. Big bundles like this. They were fun to carry in the mail bags. Uh, we got a little bit of news from that. A lot of hometown newspapers like, I was originally from uh, Northern Park, California, San Fernando Valley. We had the Valley Green Sheet. We got a lot of news about LA and what was going on in the Valley. Uh, my sister would send it to me every once in a while. But there wasn't a lot printed in the papers about demonstrations. Even the people getting the LA Times and the New York Times and things like that. And we didn't know the full extent of it until we got back. We, just, we had a little inkling. Kent State happened, I was at Fort Hood, Texas, and I got out three days after that. But when Kent State happened, a lot of the feelings down at Fort Hood, Texas was, good, that'll teach them. That's how the soldiers down there felt about the demonstration. Do you want to ask, what, what do you want to add to that? What's your... We took an oath to uphold the U.S. Constitution, but when you talk about getting your newspapers censored and things like that, that kind of goes against the grain of the United States Constitution, doesn't it? You know, we were in control. No, I know you were. So <laughs> Neither was I, but <laughs> I wasn't in control. I'm just asking. You know, we all took an oath to uphold the U.S. Constitution, which is freedom of speech, freedom of the press, freedom of religion. And then we had our newspaper censored on the Kitty Hawk. We had a daily newspaper too, it was censored too. It just seems to go against the grain of what we fight for. The military tells you what they want you to know. Yeah, I'm aware it. of that, but yet we took a uphold the Constitution. We're on the stairs. That was the 60s. Mike, Lewis. I think there's a the flip side to that. Uh, number one, I don't think that and the military powers that were in charge wanted the morale in Vietnam to slide because of hearing things that happened back in the U.S. I mean, we had a big enough problem doing search and destroying and having to retake another hill again, let alone to find out that there were people back there that didn't think too highly of us. So I, I think that there was probably another flip side to that, that they didn't want the fighting man over there to hear all this crap. Okay? And that's why I think a lot of them didn't get into Stars and Stripes and some of the other magazines. I agree with that, but eventually we all have to deal with it in time. Well, yeah, they thought they were protecting us, okay? So. Another question, please? Go ahead. Go ahead. Yes, uh, uh, I was in during the Vietnam War, and um, I was stationed in Germany, and our unit got wiped out in the Tet Offensive. I was with the 3rd the 11th ACR. Now, in my opinion, General, General uh, Westmoreland caused a lot of casualties 
by downplaying the ASA intelligence reports that were coming down there that cost a lot of American lives. I'll tell you, sir, there's 58,479 names on the wall down in D.C. And there are about half of them that shouldn't be there. But eight women as well. I'm wondering uh, if you could look to the cadets uh, down there to your left. And we're charged with our RTC department, the development of leaders of character. Uh, some of them will be, in two months, be in charge of platoons. Uh, some of them are, have a few more years left. And I'm wondering if you might give them some advice and what you remember about your very best leaders, your very best lieutenants, and your very best captains from your service. Listen, listen, to, Go ahead, to, listen to the I'm, sergeants that were there. The other thing is, being in the Navy and coming up through the ranks, I would say don't have anybody do anything you would not do yourself. You know, your men will respect you. You have to earn it. You cannot control it. You have to earn it. I'll give them an example. I was on an AKA, which is a cargo vessel, and I had a 90-ton boom. On this boom, it was attached to a tower on the ship 90 feet tall. I'm scared to death of height. Have been all my life. But I had to have my people go up there and do a job. And guess what? I strapped myself together, overcame my fear, and went up that tower before I let any of my people go up. You have to be able to do that. No having people do something that you will not do yourself. Um, I have a, uh, a captain that was out in the field with us, and he came up through the rank. He started out as a private, and uh, then he went to ROTC or whatever, anyhow. When he got to Vietnam, he was a captain. And uh, I was 20 years old, and he was 23 years old. Now, he never told us this until later. But uh, he, he went out in the bush with us with a 45 on his hip. That's all he carried was a 45. And after the first month or month and a half, we would have followed him anywhere and, done, and do anything that he asked us to do. That's the type of person he was. He slept with us. Um, when we were, well, we were not in the base camp. We were out, in, we were out in the bush, like I said, and we were on patrols and, and ambushes at night and stuff. And he was set up with different ones, and uh, and talk to us and, and make sure that you knew how to call in artillery or you knew how to do this. And, uh, he just he just schooled you, made you really made you feel good. Our squad leader that we had. Uh, came in the same time I did. He was from Wyoming. And uh, he volunteered to be point man, which I didn't have any problem with that. I mean, you want to be point man, you know, go, go right ahead. But he was good at tracking and, uh, and watching things, seeing things. And uh, he, he took the point. And later on, he became our squad leader. And once again, we would follow him. Because he did it, you know, hey, we would do it. And, um, and back to this one question, after, after uh, I got the Silver Star of uh, December the 22nd, uh, I was scared, ain't no question about that. But, hey, I went and did everything I was supposed to do. I was probably one of, one of the best soldiers that we had. I, I did my thing. I didn't get scared until I got back. <laughs> That's, that's when I got scared. But, um, you know, uh, the only thing I can say to you younger guys is just do your thing, uh, read the books, understand what you're supposed to be doing. Uh, we had one sergeant, for an example, an E6, came over there, and nobody paid attention to him. He was about the biggest jackass there was <laughs> from Ohio. You know, yeah, he's a shaking baby. He, he didn't know nothing. So, you know, and he didn't get the respect. You know, we were going out, uh, 
true story. We were going out on an ambush, and, and I hate to say it, but I was one. I'm like, I ain't going out there with him. And there was there were about 18 of us, and uh, the guys trusted me. I'm, I'm not going out there with him. He don't know how to call an artillery or, or anything else. So we set up with the listening patrol about 100 yards outside the base. There was 20 of us out there. I wasn't going out at a mile and a half under his control. Shucks, you must be crazy. <laughs> Mike and then Bob I think, I think if I were a young guy again, like you young people down here in the military, I would read everything I could put out by Colonel North, Oliver North. You may not even know who I'm talking about. Look at that. They don't even know who I'm talking about. How many know who Oliver North is? Come on! Come on, guys. You gotta read. Oliver North, I would follow him up any damn hill in this world. Excellently. Excellently. Also, lone survivor, Lieutenant Murphy. I know you know about him, right? Mm -hmm. Lieutenant Murphy was a hell of a man. He took three in the back for his crew. Dead as a doornail. But you'll never forget his name. Nell of Honorwood. Oliver North and Murphy. Mike Mazzaro. I'm a retired E7. I trained a lot of second lieutenants. Just remember, whatever you learn in OBC, whatever you learn in your branch basis, is not the gospel in the field. Listen to your NCOs. They know what's going on. What they teach you in, in all the officer courses, same with the, the NCOs, is Army doctrine. This is what they say is going to work. It doesn't. Listen to the NCOs, they know what's going on. If you have to take a back seat to them, take a back seat. But listen to what they're saying and watch what they do. Learn. And you'll okay. Get it. okay, another question? Good evening, guys. Thank you very much for your service. Thank you. Um, you know, throughout this, the, the discussion, I was just, I looked up the Vietnam War on Wikipedia, and something just it, alarming to me. Um, you know, obviously, it came to the end of the capture of Saigon in April 1975. And uh, it says that uh, North and South were reunified. Um, I guess maybe that's, I look at that as I know, 20 years of nothing, maybe, because they were reunified. I mean, ultimately, it was a, it was a civil war, right? Between the, the North Korea and the South. Is that what um, you're saying? Where's the land, though? I guess my question is. When you were deployed, when you were sent over, you had uh, you had personal thoughts and ideas of why you were going there. How did they compare to your personal thoughts of why you were there? If a couple of you could maybe like share. Day, like day and night. In other words, when I first went to Vietnam, I thought I was going to stop communism. And then once I got there and, we had, and I was in the unit and we were fighting, I realized and, and you had to get all these, you had to call and get approval to shoot somebody and you went back to the same place over and over again. It was like we weren't there to win. And we realized that we were fighting not for just the United States, but fighting for ourselves so we could go back to our loved ones alive. We realized that we weren't going to win. They didn't give us the authority to win. They didn't give us the, uh, the supplies to win. It was a bad situation and in my unit, Mike 37, we knew that. Mike 37, by the way, and, uh, and Ted Fessy was in hand-to-hand -hand combat. So it was, it was a, a very a well-oriented uh, combat unit. So we realized as guys, we said, you know, we're fighting for ourselves. We're going to go home and be with our loved ones. We knew we weren't there to win. And that kind of bothered us because our training said otherwise. Our training said we were supposed to go in and win. 
Well, it wasn't. It didn't happen that way. The politicians controlled it. And during, and high, school, Bob, during high school, I never knew what Vietnam was. I graduated in 64. Never heard of Vietnam. Yeah. Yeah, it was going on, and it was kind of early, early stage. There were some advisors over there in Green Beret and stuff. Had no, I didn't have a clue. And it got drafted, and people really didn't think much of it except the shock of being drafted. But the first night in basic training, the company commander got everybody together in the barracks and said, your chances of going to Vietnam are as good as anybody's. But he said, if anybody asks you where you're going, tell them Germany. And it wasn't Germany. Uh, I, I'm same as Ed, I, you know, I didn't know what Vietnam was. I was born and raised on a farm. So, uh, you know, drafted and, and I get over there, but it was probably 20 years after I got back that I really got pissed off. Because when we would go into the rubber plantations, we, we, the captain would tell us, okay, let's take a break. We could lay there and rest four or five hours, never worrying about nothing. You know, and it, it, you know, it kind of hit me there. Well, why is it that we could rest in the rubber plantations? As soon as we walk outside of them, snipers and mortars and whatever. And then I'm, I'm back here and I, I'm, I'm reading a, or, or the news or something, and they start talking about the rubber plantations in Vietnam were owned by Firestone and B.F. Goodridge and uh, Michelin. And, and I'm like, you got to be kidding me. You mean to tell me we were over there? garden, their rubber plantations. And you know, them rubber trees, they didn't get hit. <laughs> they, 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 didn't, they didn't get water. <laughs> those rubber plantations were producing rubber through the whole time while I was there. Just the buckets of rubber going out. And that's what I was over there for. That's when I got upset. I got upset when you'd see the Arm of the South Vietnamese troops, they'd be studying in their compounds. The American troops were out on patrols. One time when we was on patrol, we had a group of Arvins meet up with us during the day. They had an American advisor with them. We did get into a firefight, maybe last 10 minutes. Them people did not shoot back. They were just hungered down. They did shoot back. And when it started getting towards evening, they had to go back to their compound. And we had to sleep out there in the bush. Well, and troops I was with, American troops I was with, we had no faith in the army. Bill Dilley? Yeah, when, uh, as I said in my introduction, I, I got my draft notice in 68. And when I was fragged, go over to Southeast Asia, it, it was not my first duty assignment. But uh, I did not get into the politics up, up here as why I was over there and why we as a military force were over there. And, it, and your question goes hand in hand with a recent uh, sermon I was listening to at, at my church. And the uh, minister was talking about military campaigns throughout the ages. And we got on to the subject of the whole armor of God. Why, why was I over there? I was over there in relation to this church sermon. I was fighting. Why does the soldier fight? Was the question in the sermon. And the answer is, we fight for each other. There's, there's, no, there's no two ways about it. It was nothing for me as an aircraft mechanic to be underneath the belly of my jet. We just put two new engines in it. We're, we're running it at full afterburner. You have a headset on. The, the noise just goes right through. But it was nothing to work 12, 14, 16 hours at a time to get your jet ready for its next sortie. Why? because that jet was going to go out there and support my brothers in the field, the grunts. And if I had to do it all over again, yes, if I was physically able, I would. Mike Lewis? I had a lot of mixed feelings when I first went to Vietnam. 
But since, since that time, I've actually met a girl who was, family was tortured by the communists. Her brother and her father both held prisoners for six to eight years after 75, before they were released. And they all were reunited in, in Taiwan. But those who wanted freedom, South Vietnamese who wanted the freedom that we had here in the United States, they never got it, even though we went there to try to help them obtain it, okay? So even though a number of the people in South Vietnam supported us, there was a lot that did not. <coughs> Now, since I've had the opportunity to go with this young lady and speak in some high schools, and her story is phenomenal from what her family suffered at the hands of the communists and everything that they had was taken from them. So she supported the Americans while we were over there more than 100%. And to this day, she probably salutes every American flag that she goes by. Hmm. She's more patriotic than some of the people I see in this country. <laughs> but there are and there were a lot of good people in South Vietnam that wanted us there to help them to get their freedom. But we weren't able to obtain it for them because of political decisions that were made. Okay? So climate of the people here in this country, it's, it's a shame. I'm just thankful that now the people in this country show the support that they do to the guys that are coming back from Afghanistan and Iraq and these other <coughs> conflicts. Because conflicts aren't going to go away. There's always going to be somebody that doesn't like the way we live and does not want their country to be in the freedom status like us. So there's a verse in the Bible that says there's going to be wars and always rumors of wars until the end of time. So it's not going to go away. So what do we have to do as American citizens is to be prepared, okay, and when we do have to put our foot forward and do something. And I'll be honest with you, I'm a little scared right now, other than these people that are sitting down here, of the climate of some of the other young men in this country, and seeing reports that 65% of them are unfit to serve in the military. I mean, I, I, that scares me. I don't know if it scares you, but it scares me that we might not be able to defend ourselves if we really got into an all-out war, but um, I, I question a lot of patriotism sometimes, maybe I shouldn't, but I don't see a lot of people standing up saluting the American flag when it goes by in a parade. I don't see the hand over the heart. So are we really a patriotic nation? We say we are, but are we? I mean, our actions speak louder than our words. And so, from my point of view, I guess I'm a little concerned seeing a majority of the young people, and I'm not talking about you folks here in the ROTC, God bless you. <coughs> but there are some out there that could care less. As long as they're getting what they're getting, they don't care. When I was in high school, my sophomore year, I listened to a president named John F. Kennedy say, ask not what your country can do for you. Ask what you can do for your country. And if you put that question out there to a lot of the young people today, I'd be afraid of the answers you would get. I really would be afraid of the answers you would get. Okay, Leon, it's 8.06, we have about 24 minutes. Uh, so what I'd like to do is anybody that hasn't asked a question, that wasn't recognized to answer, ask the question, please raise your hands and the guy, the gentleman with the uh, microphone can get to you. Let's get some new comments, new questions. 
My name is Jerry Roy Glider. I served in the United States Seabees and proud of it. I was in Vietnam 1968 and into 70. Red Beach. And, no. <laughs> Close. But anyways, I am an American and I believe in freedom. I believe in freedom for those youngsters that I've seen every day in Vietnam that didn't have no future. I was hoping to uh, see that they would have freedom uh, someday in their lives. But also, I, I this country is the best country in the world, and we serve to keep our freedom. And that's what it's all about to me. That's the reason why I serve because in this country, it's freedom. Another question, please? Gentlemen, now. Uh, I'm curious, uh, have you had much experience with the uh, Rock Marines and the uh, uh, Aussies, uh, coalition forces that were over there? What were your impressions? Uh, and what military equipment impressed you the most as it developed through the war? I knew about the rocks, they were a bunch of badasses. <laughs> I can attest to that because I was with the rocks. They, they took no prisoners. They collect ears. <laughs> they got long <laughs> tables with ears on them. For every kill, they get an ear. They had good liquor, too. That's what I'm told. Jim. <laughs> mention the rocks, if anybody doesn't know what that stands for, it's Republic of Free and Troops. They were incredible. I remember uh, uh, one of the LZs we were at, we were next to a town that was supposed to be like almost 100% Viet Cong or Viet Cong sympathizers. We wouldn't dream of going into that town without our weapons. The rocks would walk through town anytime they wanted to, not even with, with a gun or, or a pistol or anything. No, they, they, they were fearless. And the, and the Viet Cong were scared to death. Of scared to death. Yeah. Yes. They were amazing. Yeah, we used to watch them do their, go through their kung fu or wherever it is that they, they, that they do. Every morning they'd be out there practicing that. And I used to think to myself, well, I'm sure they were not fighting these people. <laughs> uh, did any of the Vietnam vets out here remember Tang Nam? Is anybody there? <coughs> Tang Nam was near the Cambodian border. And it was half Korean, half U.S. On the uh, U.S. side, they had the dirt roads like most base camps did, uh, tent cities or hooches, whatever. The other side was Korean, the rocks. They had paved streets, they had street lights, they had air-conditioned barracks. Uh, they made out better than we did. Anybody else? Another question from somebody else. Go ahead, back there. <laughs> I have a question. As far as the Korea draft again, how much do you think this country would respond to a draft? To the draft? Go ahead, Bob. If the draft is ever instituted, look out Canada. Uh, but the next time the draft is instituted, they'll probably draft women as well as men. Draft is necessarily the only method. I think every person in this country others has served in some capacity one year and learned to appreciate what they have. I am not going to be in the And then you can thank Uncle Sam for what he's done for you. Uh, from my own experience, I cannot take anything for granted. And we should all kneel every night and thank God we live in the United States. Next question. Any question, please? Microphone. Beside. Go ahead. Go ahead. I'd like to thank the organizers for putting this on. When I, when I saw this in our local paper, that there was a, a Vietnam Veterans Forum. There was, there was an inner voice that told me I had to come tonight. Uh, all these questions and all this discussion peels back 
a lot of inner feelings that, that have been inside me for a long time. And I was one that didn't know what I was going over there for. And when I came back, I tried to read several books to understand it. And it did make me bitter. A couple of you commented on that. But I think a great thing to remember is that put the politics aside. We have some great things to fight for in this country. We have some of the greatest universities the world has to offer with medical research. Uh, I don't think, I know there isn't another country that I'd want to live in in this world today. Uh, you know, sir, we do a lot of schools, high school. We talk to a lot of juniors and seniors and a lot of sophomores. And we tell them if they could see the world through our eyes, they would know how well and good they have it in this country. They haven't seen hunger. They haven't seen guys or people who have gone a week or two without food. They live in a great country. You talked about the motivation when we were over there. I was on the ground. I, I tired an M60 for 10 months, and I seen a lot of what you all were talking about up there, and I would like to talk to a few of you later, especially the one in the 4th Infantry Division. I had a great friend over there that served up in play too. But uh, my motivation was to come back to this great country that I lived in, the only country that I ever knew. And I also read a book, uh, if you think the communists were not treacherous people, there was a book written, in fact, I, I requested a library down in Maryland to, to uh, get it as soon as it came out. It was written by Gerald Coffey. He was a POW Navy pilot, and uh, he served, he, he was a POW about the same length, uh, length of time that John McCain was a, a POW. The name of the book was Beyond Survival. If, if you ever have a chance, read that book, and, and it'll, you'll understand a little bit better why we were fighting over there, uh, the way they tortured people, and so on and so forth. But, and I'd like to thank Millersville University as well for allowing us to use their facilities. Thank you. Thank you. Another question? Back there. I just have a quick announcement for those who uh, entered in for the 50-50 raffle for the Student Veterans Association. We'll be pulling that number at 8.30, just so you guys can forget about it. Thank you. Another question over here? had a lot of heavy conversation. It's kind of lighthearted. Coming back from Vietnam, what was one of the, other than family of course, what was one of the first American things you were looking forward to eating or doing? Taylor's, Taylor's pork roll sandwich with good Italian roll. Or good Italian roll. Good. I, uh, I have a, a great story about coming home. Oh. I, you know, during the last two weeks, I was allowed to go to an APL there at the Camp Tinshaw. One of the crab masters got ill, and I had to take his spot and go back up to the uh, Calviet River to Don Hunt. So I only got about six days on the APL to get ready to come home. Well, on the way home, first of all, you get to the airport there in the van, and this big, beautiful Continental jet rolls in. And it's one of the biggest aircraft that we had at that time, which was the 707. Yeah, 707. Mm -hmm. Anyway, it holds about 250 people. When we got on the air, aircraft, the pilot said, everybody strap in because I'm going to have complete control of this aircraft <coughs> and we're going to do a couple of strange maneuvers. I said, oh, Lord. I said, I've been in here. 14 months and this pilot's going to kill me on the way home. Well, anyway, he took off down the runway. It was, it only rolled down the runway maybe 7,500 feet, and he pulled the throttles back on that thing, and that bird shot straight up through the clouds. When we got up on top, 
and I looked around, I had an aisle seat. There was 10 of the most beautiful women I have ever seen in my life. And they had on many skirts. <laughs> now, you know, we're lean, mean, fighting men, you know. I'm only 27 years old. So we hadn't heard of many skirts. So consequently, I got a very bad back because of like this. I was like this all the way from today Vietnam to Pearl Harbor, Hawaii. I could have sold that seat for 50 bucks a pop. But I declined. It was a great, great trip back. <laughs> That's why I like a bit. it. You gotta be light about this stuff. You know, we try to forget the bad things that happened to us and try to remember the very good things that happened to us. And you young people over here, man, you've got a hell of a for the future if you just apply yourself. Any questions? Things I wanted to do when I got home was buy a brand new car. I got home on Saturday and Labor Day weekend, Wednesday, all Wednesday after Labor Day, I had a brand new 69 Camaro Super Sport. <laughs> Another question out there, please? We're getting short. <laughs> Go ahead over here. Go ahead. I got an observation and I've got a question. Uh, the observation is I'd like to revisit this concept or at least this term PTSD. Last word being a disorder, Big Bob's heard me complain about this over and over again. Post-traumatic stress is a war wound. Schizophrenia is a disorder. If you have post-traumatic stress, you suffer a wound in war just as if you got hit by a bullet or a shrapnel. So forget about the disorder and just face it, it is a wound just as real as anything else. And uh, you know any stigma that goes with a disorder should go by the wayside. The uh, question I have for you, is I see a bunch of guys up there that have worked with our OEF, OIF guys coming back from Iraq, Afghanistan. You guys came back to less than a, a great reception. Question is now in 2017, what can we do for you? Well, this is it. That's what I thought the question. That's <laughs> great. Thanks. Okay. Well, Mike? I'll take it. Right. Uh, Doing what you do, like, thank you for your service, is one of the best things that anyone could say to us. November 11th, last year, we go down to the wall on Veterans Day to say hello to our buddies. This trip down, I was humbled. It takes a lot to humble me. But a young boy, he might have been five, that little hand, how about that big? He came up to me and he said, sir, can I shake your hand? God, I'm telling you, man. I shook his little hand and tears come out of my eyes. Not afraid to admit it. Because when I left my son and my daughter at the airport, when I left for a big trip, they were that size. So it all came back to me right then and there. My fellow veteran on the end of this table knelt down and hugged the little boy. No? Yeah, the little boy's name was Elliot. After he was shaking hands with Bob, he came to me. I was stood right next to Bob. And he says, can I shake your hand? I knelt down so I was eye level with little Elliot. And I said, can I give you a hug? And little Elliot put his arms up around my neck. I put my arms around his back. And about a thousand and one cameras started going off. Yeah. And I too was moved to tears. That that was a welcome home. Dick Mowry and uh Ken Ford, would you answer that question? Since you guys haven't uh, answered a lot of questions. Um, uh, I don't know how I want to answer it. 
there's a lot of things that <clears throat> could be done, and it's going to take some good people to do it. Uh, what we're seeing now in the government is all of its politics. They're not helping the veterans. They're not doing anything for the military. All they care about is each other. <coughs> I don't, I don't know how to, um, by myself, to do anything about it. But together, we can uh, put people in there that are concerned with the way we should be going, not the way we are now. So I think uh, it would be good if each and every one of you Write your congressman. Tell me what you saw tonight here at uh, this forum. What uh, the veterans think. And hopefully it'll get better. Yeah, I think uh, what you can do for us, <coughs> you said the same thing, but uh, let's say on a, a per more personal note from everybody, is keep on thinking veterans. Don't, don't be afraid if you go to a cemetery, don't be afraid to stop for a second. You don't have to be a Vietnam veteran. Just stop for a second and say thank you. There's plenty of, there's plenty of cemeteries out there. There's plenty of tombstones out there. A lot of them are marked with flags. A lot of them are marked with plaques on the back of the war they were in. Don't be afraid to say thank you. And that, that helps a lot. It really does. Like I, say, I, I, I know there's people you say, thank you for your service. But, yeah, big deal. Nah, that's not the case. <coughs> Saying thank you to some a veteran is, is to me is one of the greatest things you can do. Because you finally say, Oh, yes, we did something. We did something good. Even though a lot of people think we did it bad, we did do something good. So don't be afraid to say thank you. That's, to me that's that's big. Can I just comment on this question? Uh, it, just like he said, uh, it happened to me a couple of times in veterans things that happened years and years ago. The first time I went down the wall, I was really out of it for a while. And I had an event one time, and we were standing here inside of a church, and it was a, it was a, it was it wasn't a religious service; it was just a service honoring veterans. And I was standing there; I wasn't in my uniform. I had my fatigue shirt on with my some patches and some ribbons and stuff. When I was standing there, and, a, and I just somebody out of the corner of my eye, it was a woman who walked over to me, middle way, and she says, "Can I give you a hug?" And I said, oh, "Okay." So she gave me a hug, and she said, "Thank you," and then just walked away. I had no idea who that was. A, that hit me. And another time I was at, out of Park City when they had the movable wall out there. And uh, I was going back to my car and there was a piece of paper stuck in the windshield. I thought I got a ticket. Or somebody hit my car. And I pulled out and all it said was thank you. I have no idea who it came from. I still have that note today. And that, 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 to me, I've a lot. Another question. We have about five minutes left. Go ahead. New question. I think we all um, appreciate the fact that we have some good forms in this crowd that are willing to serve. And I am sure all of us, I say thank you to you for what you're going about to do. Question, please. I want to comment. Um, I'm a good friend of Ed Bookman's. I have a lot of respect for him. Call him Daddy. Um, I was born in 1964 and have some pretty strong memories of in second, third grade of brothers and sisters of friends of mine going to war didn't know too much about Vietnam then. Uh, my son was in boot camp during 9-11, served in Iraq and Afghanistan, and I want to thank you because when he was there, he was supported, and I can't imagine, I think I might have killed somebody. <laughs> And they said anything about my baby when he was over there. And that's it. Thank you. God bless you. God bless you. Thank you. <laughs> one more question. One more. I have one more. I have one here. One question. Go ahead. Um, I, go, I go to the VA here in, up in Lebanon, and I've had nothing but good experiences up there. Um, I just want to know if. Y'all up there felt the same way? And if so, why do you think that is? Like, why, why do we have it so good and I hear about all these you know, horror stories out in Arizona and everything? Well, I, I'll answer that. I think in the last 15 years, 
things have really changed with the VA. I know today um, I cannot say anything bad about the VA, but 20 years ago I could. But the Vietnam veterans have really fought to make it better, and, and uh, we have called our congressmen and our senators, and they know that we vote, and um, they've made some changes. And I expect them to get better, not worse. Jim? I just, I know there's been a lot of horror stories about the VA centers throughout the United States, but I can tell you, having been to the Camp Hill, New York, and Lancaster uh, centers, and, as well as the Lebanon VA Hospital, I can't say enough about them. They've been wonderful for me. Um, I can tell you, I, I know that the Lebanon VA Hospital is ranked among the top uh, 10, I think, VA hospitals in the United States. Those people up there are absolutely amazing. I can't say enough about them. It's just been, my experience with them has just been incredible. Where's Tom I'm doing this with Okay, uh, we here in Lancaster County are very fortunate. We have one of the finest VA service officers that services the veterans of Lancaster County, Dan Tooth, <coughs> and his two assistants, Jen and Jody. All three are military veterans. And for any veterans listening to me right now, if, if you have any issues at all, please don't hesitate. Take your 214 with you. Go down, see Dan Tooth or his assistants. They will get you any and all assistance that you need and that you are entitled to. They do go the extra mile. I am living proof. They, they helped me with my PTSD issues, and just under a year ago, I, my uh, service connection disability rating was up to 70%. Mm -hmm. And I, I suffered with, with my issues to a certain extent for decades. And once I retired from uh, full-time employment, the issues started surfacing more and more frequently. Dan Tooth and his assistants were there for me. They will be there for you. Thank you. Okay, that ends our Q&A period. Uh, for the next hour, what you can do is you can peruse and look at the artifacts. Visit with any panelist. Wait, visit with any panelist right here you want to talk to. Visit the veterans organizations out there in the, in the hallway. And uh, you can see what's going on. Yes, well, last comment. That's it, last one. Before everybody gets up. Um, you know, we have a veterans court in Lancaster County. And we need mentors to help these young veterans that are coming back from Iraq and Afghanistan that have gotten into trouble. And uh, if anybody's interested in helping on Thursdays for like three hours, okay, these guys and women need help. And all you have to do is be a veteran with an honorable discharge to help. And we do need help. So if anybody's interested, please see me and I'll get your information and let you volunteer. Thank you. Okay. Hold on a second. Before everybody leaves uh, and, and starts the other part of our, our uh, program, the RLTC people want to take a picture of all the veterans up here. Uh, so if we can get together real quick and you guys can watch it. Watch it. Ryan Moore, come on up. Take care. Thank you very much. Thank you for coming. Yeah. 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 Yeah.